Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Eva Dace and I am a member of the marketing department here at Vitek Corporation. I will be your host during today's webinar as Tommy Liddy presents Theater of Operation, an entertaining problem. Before we get started, I would like to review a few technical details. First, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time via the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's event, and we plan to respond to the questions at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned. Second, recording. The webinar is being recorded today. If you are having technical difficulties during the presentation, an online archive of this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live version. Now let me introduce our presenter. Tommy Liddy is a mechatronic engineer completing his PhD in robotics at the University of Adelaide while working as part of the model-based system systems engineering team at Aerospace Concepts. His academic study has focused on navigation control for Ackerman vehicles and use, uses vector fields as control schemes. As part of the MBSC team at Aerospace Concepts, Tommy is developing MBSC tools for operational analysis and capability definition. And now the moment we have all been waiting for. Welcome, Tommy. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Eva, for that uh, introduction. I just want to make a quick shout out to my uh, co-authors, uh, Dr. David Harvey and uh, Mr. Michael Waite and Mr. Paul Logan, uh, some of whom are back in Australia. I think it's about uh, midnight, one o'clock over there. So if they're up listening, a uh, quick hello. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, theater of operations, um, give you a quick uh, presentation overview. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit of the context of model-based systems engineering, uh, model-based systems engineering approach and, and uh, why we do that. Uh, discuss the uh, user needs uh, through operational analysis and, and um, uh, analysis of the, uh, the performers. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the solution, the methodology uh, we use to keep focus on, uh, on our users and, uh, and why we do this. And I'm going to do this through a, a bit of an example, an entertaining problem. Uh, we're going to look at uh, putting on a theatre company putting on a certain play uh, that play is uh, Macbeth. Uh, I apologize for any um, of you that are theatrically minded and have to get up and do a little dance every time I say the name. I'll try not to say it too many times. Um, and then we'll abstract that just a little bit into a, a generic model uh, just to show um, yeah, uh, the, the generic aspect of, of what we've done. Uh, so first up, uh, what is systems engineering? Um, systems engineering uh, really is just a, a structured approach to uh, definition, design, and implementation of a system. Um, and we use that to address uh, user-defined problems. Uh, I get the feeling I might be uh, preaching to the choir uh, in this presentation. I'm, I'm sure many of you know uh, and use systems engineering. Um, and what is uh, model-based systems engineering, or what pushes us towards uh, model-based systems engineering? Um, Basically, the, there are a few things that we identify that pushes us towards using uh, model models or model based through our systems engineering. One is uh, the outsourcing of knowledge, uh, recording systems knowledge instead of retaining that knowledge. I mean, if you think about um, uh, how you live your, your general day, uh, we don't actually record a lot of knowledge. We don't keep a lot of knowledge in ourselves. Uh, for instance, I don't know how many stitches are on a baseball, uh, but I do record the the method I would use to discover that information, which is basically I'll Google it. Um, and this is one of the things that pushes us towards model-based um, when we do our systems engineering, is uh, we want to be able to, we know how to gather information, we know how to store information, and we know how to get that information, um, which means that we don't need to keep that information within our own heads. Um, one of the reasons we do that is the increased complexity of projects. Um, versus our ability to, to keep all that information in our head. Um, if you look at uh, something like Metcalf's, uh, Metcalf's law, which is uh, used to define the, the size of a network, uh, if you have 100 pieces of information that all are interconnected, uh, that's a lot of information you have to keep. You have to keep that, those bits of information in your head, as well as the relationship between those bits of information. Um, if you compare that to Miller's magical number, which is the amount of thoughts that a, that a person can really keep in their head at one time, it's about a dozen, um, it becomes uh, quite difficult. So uh, we use this model-based approach to um, store that information instead of, if, instead of trying to keep it. And we also do it uh, because we like to work in teams. Uh, we all kind of work as a, as a team. We all, we all uh, kind of work with each other and do work together. 
using a model-based approach, using uh, all knowing how to gather that information, um, we can uh, put a large amount of information into one space, into one model, and as long as we all know how to access the information, we all have the knowledge of how to find that information, um, we don't either need to be the ones that have the knowledge in our head or even the ones that put it into the system uh, to be able to access that information. So that's, uh, that's a, a quick overview of systems engineering and, and why uh, we as a group have been pushed towards uh, model-based systems engineering. Um, that's the what and the why. Uh, now there's the where. Uh, where do we use model-based systems engineering? Uh, where do we look at model-based systems engineering uh, in the life cycle? Uh, Basically, we can use model-based systems engineering anywhere from early in the development cycle of a, a project through to uh, the design, the, the production, the VMV, uh, the support, and through the retirement. So the entire life cycle of a, of a project, that's where we use the uh, model-based systems engineering. And what are the, the big uh, benefits of, of model-based systems engineering? Uh, well. Model-based systems engineering, uh, traceability, consistency, adaptability, and robustness. These are all the, the big uh, benefits of, of uh, doing your systems engineering in this, in this way. Uh, traceability, very important. Uh, being able to understand uh, where your design decisions, where your choices, where your, where your uh, ideas have come from, um, how they affect the system as a whole. Uh, this is, this is uh, very, very important. Uh, we, we like to... Uh, we can then use this traceability to uh, kind of have consistency within our knowledge um, and also a single source of truth, which is, which is very important. Uh, in a model-based systems engineering approach, we like to have one model that represents an entire system. Uh, one model that does this, uh, then you have your, your single source of truth. If you can imagine uh, a report, if you have a report on a, on a system, someone's written a nice uh, document for you, uh, you email that to your to your colleagues, they all have a look at it, they make changes, they all have different versions of the truth, they all have different versions of the information, you don't have that single source of truth. Uh, one of the benefits of model-based systems engineering, if you use a, a centralized model, is uh, you have one place where all that truth lives, one place where, where all that information lives, and then the documents, the artifacts, uh, they are taken from that single source of truth. Um, and, and that, that leads into the adaptability of, of the model. Uh, you can, uh, with, the, with using the right tools, you can uh, basically produce any view, any, uh, you can pull any information out of that model that you want at any time, uh, which is quite useful. You can also uh, produce a, a large variety of views on that model, uh, which means that uh, you don't have to have uh, one massive report or one, one massive piece of information that you pass around to, to everyone. Uh, if you have uh, an accounting department, uh, a uh, management department, you have an engineering department, you can produce individual views that those, uh, those individual, those different aspects of, of the uh, project team need, you can produce them from the model and then uh, you don't have to have uh, superfluous information uh, to any one group. And um, the robustness, robustness of information, uh, it, it, it's very, it's, uh, it's the information is made very clear, it's made uh, explicit, your, your uh, relationships between information, um, there's kind of a, a secondary, uh, secondary to the information you put in, there's also uh, this like correctness of the information. So uh, when you have your, your model-based system, uh, you, you join two items together or you join a group of items together, um, that information uh, can be very, is, you can have trust in that, it's very strong, it's very robust. Uh, if you have a dozen views that look at those relationships, they're all the same. You can have that, that information is, is uh, yeah, kept very much the same because it's looking at the same uh, single source of truth. So um, yeah, these are these are the benefits of model-based systems engineering, and these are these are why we use model-based systems engineering. So uh, looking at what we'll be going through today, uh, we're going to look at using model-based systems engineering in the concept phase of a project. So this is very early in the life cycle of a project. Uh, we're going to look at the 
the needs analysis and the requirements analysis uh, in a project. So if we look at the, the life cycle, um, the, the start of a project, the development, production and retirement, uh, we're going to just look at the conception phase of the project. Um, and in that phase, we, uh, we, we look at user needs analysis, systems requirements analysis, system solution, uh, solution system synthesis, and system definition validation. Um, we're going to uh, look at the very start of this, uh, of the conception phase. So we're going to look just at the user needs analysis. Um, and the way we do that is uh, uh, we're going to do a um, operational analysis method and a um, user needs, uh, so a user needs elicitation from an uh, operational analysis uh, method. Um, so basically we identify uh, the mission, the context, the organization architecture, and then we develop uh, an operational scenario, so uh, maybe a, a campaign um, that we're going to uh, go through and then we identify who is going to be doing this, this campaign, um, uh, how we're going to measure its effectiveness, and um, then we start analysing the operational needs, uh, which, are, which are very important. And uh, it's, it's key to note that development and analysis, this is a very iterative uh, process and um, we'll, probably, we'll be discussing that a little bit uh, in the presentation. So what's our, what's our key statement here? Um, we're going to be looking at user needs today. So uh, what we're going to say is when MBSC is applied to capability definition, definition, we're able to help people ask for what they need and not just what they want, ensuring the user is king. And this is the, the, the purpose of this presentation today, um, to make sure uh, when you're developing a system from early in the life cycle, uh, you can define what you need uh, and you can ensure that you can get what you need. So uh, let's have a, a quick look at our uh, concept of operations. Uh, we have a, a theatre company which runs a series of performances and plays in a number of towns. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the theatre company as, a, as an organisation, a permanent organisation, uh, it then deploys as a touring company. So this is the the company that will, will leave the, uh, the permanent organization and go on tour to different towns. Um, this touring company is made up of uh, stage characters and production roles. So these are the performers. And this is a, a key part in our, in our analysis, uh, eliciting who these performers are. And then these performers will perform the activities. And, uh, and this is the, the second key part of our analysis. So, uh, figuring out who the performers are and the activities that they'll be performing. That's, uh, that's uh, where we do our heavy lifting, I suppose you'd call it. And then out of, out of uh, this method, uh, we would then get um, our user needs. So the user needs something while performing uh, in their roles. Um, so we'll have, uh, this isn't, uh, this is a large table, not meant for, for you to uh, read through every detail, uh, but basically what we're saying is we've got a theatre company, which is a permanent organisation, um, and they do permanent organisation tasks like um, uh, recruiting and training and, and uh, acquiring costumes and maintaining their, their infrastructure. They deploy as a touring company, so uh, if, if you're part of the acting group in the theatre company, you'll then become part of the cast in the Touring company, if you're if you're lucky enough to, to go on tour, um, uh, and the touring company uh, is full of uh, various elements. So these are the positions in the, the touring company. So you have your principal actor, you have your understudy actors, uh, supporting actors. You'd have all your your uh, individual stage crew, and so uh, these actors or these uh, crew, they then they then have um, roles to to perform. So if you're a member of the theatre company in the permanent organisation. Uh, while you're in the permanent organisation, you, you'll be training, you'll be doing other tasks. Then you will deploy as a part of the touring company. Uh, maybe you'll be given the role of a primary stage actor or primary stage character. Um, and then from there, as a primary stage character, you'd, have, uh, you'd be uh, assigned as a performer. So uh, we'll say Macbeth. And then as Macbeth, you then have uh, operational tasks and activities. So Macbeth, he rehearses, he performs, uh, he signs autographs uh, because as the, the uh, 
lead actor. He's he's got a bit of a following, um, and so uh, this is how we we think about structuring the um, the performers and how we think about structuring their activities. So uh, let's take this uh, into more of the specifics of the example, uh, and let's look at uh, the Scottish play as a campaign. So uh, you can see the theatre uh, capability system uh, performs a campaign of plays, um, and this includes the Scottish play. So uh, if, if you think about uh, the activity model we've got up there, this is kind of one uh, major scenario inside a, a campaign. So the campaign uh, might be uh, a, a season of touring, so touring various different towns, performing the same play. It could even be a series of uh, of touring different towns, performing different plays, or or staying in the same town and and, and doing different plays. So um, it, the the campaign can be quite large. Whereas this this is one of the um, the the main scenarios here. So uh, we're going to focus on perform the Scottish play. Um, and we're going to decompose down into um, activities and sub-activities. Uh, and basically, uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, what we try to do is we decompose down these activities and we, uh, we look at uh, the user that's going to be performing these activities or the, the performer that's going to be performing acti these activities and we keep drilling down until, uh, we keep iterating down until we have um, each activity is performed by a, sing a single performer. So, Thunder, Enter the Three Witches. Uh, this is the first line from Act 1, Scene 3. Uh, and what we've got here is uh, an activity model of uh, Act 1, Scene 3. Uh, so you can see there we've, we've broken these uh, the activities into, into lines. So we've got the stage hand, uh, the Witches 3, the stage crew, uh, Macbeth and, and various other characters all performing their their activity or uh, triggering each other's um, tasks or triggering each other's activities and and finishing the play uh, so we can see here uh, we've, we've got a few bits of information uh, worth looking at uh, one is uh, we've, we've broken down say if you look at stage crew you've got the uh, lighting technician uh, if you look at the main characters Macbeth Banquo Ross and Angus, these all have um, these are all performing activities. So a single, if you if you think about it in real terms, a single person is performing a single activity. But if we look up at uh, the witches three, uh, this is this is a little different. We've got the witches three uh, performing an activity. So these are three people performing the same activity. Uh, what we've done there is we've taken the um, the uh, the three witches. And we've aggregated them together, so into one uh, performer class. So the witches three are taken as one person because, uh, with our understanding of, of what's going on in the uh, play, they're all they're all performing the same tasks. So uh, yeah. So as we look at enter the three witches, they're performed by one performer, the witches three. Uh, opening they're opening a tirade. They actually all form the same lines. Uh, they they form them together. So uh, this is uh, one activity, and um, and so on and so forth. Whereas um, enter Macbeth, enter Banquo, uh, these are all all uh, individuals uh, performing individual activities that are just similar. Um, and then if we look further on at uh, at uh, Exuant, so uh, activity twenty in that in that uh, 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 image. Uh, you can see that's performed by characters. So again, what we've done is we've, um, in a hierarchy of of um, performers, uh, characters would be quite high. Characters would have uh, children of uh, Macbeth, Banquo, Ross, Angus, uh, which is three. Um, the actual the characters they all perform that task. So that activity is performed by one um, performer class which is the characters. So that's all characters doing the same task at the same time. Um, and this is, this is important when we look at uh, developing user needs uh, because uh, if, you, if you think about it, in this case here, uh, getting off the stage, all the characters have the same needs. So um, actually I think the witches get off the stage a little earlier than this, but um, the Macbeth, Banquo, Ross and Angus 
all have the same needs um, in, in getting off uh, the stage. So uh, what we can look at now, what we'll do is we'll take a, a single thread of, of this um, activity and we'll look at identifying the user needs. So uh, this, is, this is basically how we look at it. Uh, we'll go all the way back to uh, the production team. So we have our production team, which has the cast. Um, the cast is responsible for the performers. So this is Macbeth. Um, and the performers perform the activities. So this is all the information that we've presented so far uh, about your organization structure, about your performers, and then about your activities. But now these activities result in needs. So these are our operational needs or our user needs. And if you can have a look, uh, uh, this is a, a, a fairly good example of, of, um, of these needs. Uh, we can have a, a multiple, so you have Macbeth performing um, multiple activities, so delivering lines and delivering further lines. He's got a, a, few, um, a few blocks of lines to give in that uh, scene. Uh, you have the Witches 3 also uh, performing activities, which are uh, basically delivering lines. Um, so these all result in the same need to be seen and heard by audience. So uh, if you were to look at each uh, activity and each user individually, uh, you could produce four different needs out of, out of this, um, uh, this scenario. You have Macbeth, he delivers lines twice. He needs to be seen and heard by audience when he delivers the first lines. He needs to be seen and heard by audience when he delivers the second line. Um, but what we've done here is we've taken all these uh, needs that have, have come out of our analysis and we've consolidated these needs. So we've taken all the, all the times that uh, a, a character needs to be seen and heard by audience when he's doing a specific activity. So if you, if you think about uh, the character, the performer Macbeth needs to be seen and heard by audience when he delivers his lines, when he delivers further lines. We've uh, consolidated those into a single um, operational need. And so uh, it's a bit of a, it's a small jump, but it's a, an important one. And, um, and what this allows to, us to do in a, in a model-based uh, approach is um, if, we, if, we, if we have this here, uh, say for some reason you take the Witches 3 out of the play, you're a fickle director and you don't like the Witches 3, so you decide to wipe them out of the play altogether. Um, if you were to follow their uh, progression of identifying their user needs, well, if you don't have the Witches 3, they don't, op they don't have an opening tirade and they don't need to be seen and heard by the audience. So do we get rid of that need to be seen and heard by audience? Well, no, you don't. Because if you were to wipe out uh, that section of the, the model, the, uh, the need to be seen and heard by audience would still come from uh, Macbeth and Banquo and Ross and Angus performing, uh, delivering their lines. So um, that's one of the, the powers of, of model-based, of looking at the, uh, the system in a model-based method. Uh, we can wipe out pieces of the model and still see the traceability still there of why we wouldn't be um, simply wiping out that operational need. Um, but the Witches 3 have, have their own need. Um, they need to disappear. Um, so the, the, uh, they perform an activity and in that activity they vanish. It results in a need to disappear. If you weren't going to have the Witches 3, um, that operational need, if this was the, the extent of our, our uh, analysis, that operational need uh, would, be, would be removed uh, because it has no other um, activity performed that results in that need. Um, so uh, we'll take a, a closer look at the Witches 3. Uh, as I said before, uh, the Witches, uh, the three Witches have been aggregated up into a single performer and uh, this decision uh, was based on, uh, say, the, the, system, the, the system engineer's uh, understanding of, of what the Witches 3 do. Um, and, and we do this to keep the model as uh, simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, it's, it's a, a quote I like from, uh, from, I think it was Einstein who said, um, keep things as simple as possible, but no simpler than that. Um, so to keep our system as simple as possible, uh, we have 
the Witches 3 as a single user class, uh, a single performer class, sorry, and um, uh, all their needs are derived from, from uh, uh, that single class. So we're basically saying that none of the Witches need anything different from each other. They all need the same thing uh, when, you look at it, when you look at your system. Uh, so now, if we can, we want to continue this analysis into the system domain. So what we've got is uh, we've got our our user needs. So what we've done is we've um, developed a set of users. We've developed a set of activities, and then we've we've gone through and we've iterated through our system to uh, the best of our knowledge, and we've produced a set of operational needs. Um, mm -hmm. These can now be pushed through to the uh, to the system domain. So uh, these needs are now the basis of functions. So seen and heard by audience. Uh, well, we need to need the function provide illumination and project sound, and then these functions can be uh, allocated to components uh, specified by requirements, and they exhibit measures of performance. So so basically. What we've got uh, here is we've got a need. Uh, so this is a, our needs analysis. We've got a need that produces a requirement. And what we can actually trace all the way through is we can trace all the way back to the, um, well, we can trace all the way back to the organization. We can trace all the way back to the, uh, the performer performing an activity. So if we, if we were to keep going backwards, you'd have uh, Macbeth delivers lines, and if we trace this all the way forward, um, that uh, ends up in the requirement for light. So he needs, uh, he needs light on the system, and, it needs, and you can have a measure on that light, so it can be a certain amount of uh, illumination that he needs to be, so to, to deliver his lines, uh, he needs, he needs uh, a certain brightness, he needs a certain uh, amount of sound to carry, uh, this kind of thing. And this gives us great traceability of our system requirements um, all the way back into our, uh, our operational space. And this also gives us a, um, a great way of, of uh, trading off uh, what we can and can't do. So uh, you know, we may have a, a certain theater where uh, we've got to trade off between um, how much light we can fit in the light rigging, how much uh, the, the sound quality of the the space of the auditorium, uh, how much uh, uh, sound system equipment we can have in there, and we can trace off these uh, trade off these requirements uh, based on other constraints and other requirements. So uh, we may only have space for um, a few small speakers and a few small lights, or we may have space for um, lots of lights and uh, and and very little speakers, so um, we can do a trade-off between our, our requirements there. So uh, let's. So we'll we'll quickly break this down into a um, into kind of the generic architecture. Uh, so so what we've discussed today, we've got a, a permanent organization which is responsible for a deployed organization. Um, this deployed organization is responsible for our performers. Our performers uh, perform our activities. And these result in our user needs, and this is the the user needs analysis um, that we do. So we start with our permanent organization, and we end up with our activities and our user needs. And then, uh, as discussed in the previous slide, uh, we can push that forward into the um, the system domain, into the functions and the components and the uh, requirements. So, in uh, just to give a quick conclusion, um, model-based systems engineering. Uh, can aid in defining these user, user needs, these uh, uh, these needs very early in the development lifecycle, um, and it allows us to to really apply some rigor uh, to the development of the users and the user classes, and this can give us some consistency um, with our user needs. So if we if we develop these user classes. Uh, if we spend some time and effort developing these user classes as best we can, uh, we should uh, pull out a more concise and a more and a clearer set of user needs, um, and then when we have these, uh, so when we have these users, these user classes, uh, it's important to note that 
one user can have many needs as well as many users can have a shared need. Uh, one of the, the key steps in, in systems engineering is consolidation. Uh, so making our system, as I said before, as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, furthermore, uh, after doing this, uh, this exercise, I realized the person developing the user needs should have a good understanding of the user and the interactions uh, where possible. This is why we get in uh, subject matter experts uh, when we're doing the work, because to be honest, I know very little about Macbeth and putting on a play. And uh, if anyone out there does know about uh, putting on a play, they probably noted that uh, while looking through the uh, the model that uh, that was up on the screen. So, a quick take home message: user needs and other stakeholder requirements should be identified and described from the perspective of each class or stakeholder. So, each so. Uh, each performer, each performer should be used to develop sets of of uh, user needs, and what this will do, this will give us a solid foundation to build the system on. If you get off on the right uh, trajectory at the start of a project, it will make the rest of the project a lot easier. So, um, a few references if you if you have time to to do a bit of reading, um, and I'd say uh, thanks to all at once and to each one, uh, any questions? All right, well thank you Tommy, and uh, may I just say that was a very interesting comparison to Shakespeare play there. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to the questions. Um, I encourage the audience to help create a vibrant and interesting discussion and submit any questions via the question and chat feature in your GoToWebinar window. Um, so we have a question here from Ronald. He says, "You mentioned that developing your user sets and operational scenarios were in, were an iterate, iterative process. How do you know when you have finished an iteration?" Uh, it, that's kind of based on how much you know about uh, the system you're dealing with. So, um, uh, so if we look at look at the system uh, there, I, I didn't know a lot about. Uh, well, the, the group that developed that didn't know a lot about the um, uh, putting on a play, and so uh, we developed a set of of activities and we developed a set of um, users as best we could. And so, uh, basically, when we had uh, every activity being performed by a single uh, user or a single user class, that's when we felt that we were finished with that iteration. But if uh, if we were to get in further um, uh, experts in the field, uh, they might know a lot more about the details of the system, and so they might say, "No, the Witches Three, for example, they do vastly different things at different times." And so the next iteration would have the Witches Three as separate um, separate users, and so um, we would then have separate activities for them, and the model would. Uh, develop further. So, um, yeah, that's that's basically where we know uh, that you're finished. Uh, all your activities have a performer, and uh, you are uh, you can trust that your um, your set of activities and your set of uh, users or performers are as complete as you can get them. And then it's up to the the developers of the system to. Uh, gain more expertise, training courses, uh, subject matter experts, and then when you have more knowledge, you can then develop your system further. All right, thank you, Tommy. Well, it looks like uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Um, if anyone in the audience has any other questions or comments that you didn't get a chance to send in today, uh, we invite you to post those on the forum of our community site. You can find that at community.vitechcorp.com. And as I mentioned before, a recording of today's webinar will be posted in the resources section of our website by the close of business tomorrow. Also, I hope you will join us for the final presentation in our webinar series today at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can visit our website for details and registration. In closing, I would like to once again thank our presenter, and I'd especially like to thank all of you for joining us today. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey window will open on your screen, either in a new browser tab or in a new window. So please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinar. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>